Hey everyone, it is I, Glenn Kyle, and our next program is one of my favorites to do. We're going to look at the American Revolution from the eyes of a Continental soldier. Now, we wanted to do this one so that you could get a true, accurate picture of what it is you'll be supporting. This is the exact program that we do for school groups, distance learning, homeschool groups, uh, adult learners. When they ask for a Continental Soldier Revolutionary War program, this is what they're gonna get. So make sure you enjoy this, and if you think this is something that everyone should have access to, please think about giving a donation at the links below because this is what your money will support. Now, enough of that, let's get into a Continental Soldier. So I am dressed as, as I said, a Continental Soldier of the American Army. Now, the American Revolution, of course, began in 1775 and went all the way to 1783. And it's important to remember that we didn't know who was going to win. This is one of the important things about history you need to think about is that when we look back on it, we know how it ends. But you have to put yourself in the mindset of those who lived in the time, and you have to remember the complexities of what their life was like. So travel back in time mentally to 1776, 1778. And there are lots of different soldiers fighting for the American cause. There are militia who are men, uh, adult males between the ages of, say, 18 and 45, who can be called up immediately and bring their own clothing and weapons to go and fight for the cause, and then go back home when the danger is over. There are provincials who are raised state by state, and they are usually signed up to serve for one-year terms. Then there's the Continental, the lowly Continental soldier who would sign up for a variety of terms depending upon when in the war, excuse me, when in the war he joined. It could be one year, it could be three years, it could be for the duration, but the Continental soldier provided the core and the regular forces of American independence. They were going to be given uniforms, they were going to be given equipment, and they fought in a lot of different battles in all the theaters. Now, let me go ahead and go through the, the life of a soldier and some of his equipment. We think of soldiers as someone who's going to be fighting. And American Revolutionary War soldiers did their share of fighting, but that was not very much of most of their time. They're only going to be actually involved in military combat operations maybe 1% to 2% of the time. So what are they going to be doing the rest of that time? Well, they're going to be training and drilling, working with their officers. They're going to be marching to and fro, depending upon where the generals of the armies think the armies need to go. They're going to be doing fatigue duty, which is a fancy term for digging trenches, uh, doing cooking, uh, preparing uh, meals, forts, building roads, bridges, things like that. And during the winter time, they're going to be staying as warm as possible and still drilling and training and building their winter quarters. There's a lot of physical work to being a soldier. So why would people join up? There's a lot of different reasons throughout the entire length of the war. Initially, people wanted to sign up because they believed in the cause of American independence. There were also a lot of young men who may not have had very many other opportunities. They wouldn't have had very good paying jobs. They wanted to get away from home. They wanted an adventure. And so one of the best and quickest ways to get into an adventure was to join the army. As time went by, a lot of those folks either tended to drift away or became so involved in the army that they wanted to stay. And by the time of the end of the American Revolutionary War, you have a lot of different types of men serving in the Continental Army. You have men who have deserted from the British Army, men who have deserted from the Hessians, who were mercenaries hired by the British, who are in the American Army. You have freed are soon to be freed former slaves, African Americans who were serving in the Continental Army. As a matter of fact, by the end of the war, records are, are not exactly reliable, but we think as much as 10 to 15 percent of the Continental Army was made up of African American soldiers. And they're, as I said, they're going to be issued and they're going to be trained. General Washington's goal with the Continental Army was twofold. Number one, he wanted an army he could depend on in the field to stand up to British regulars. 
And at this time, the British Army was one of the best trained, best equipped armies in the world. And you couldn't just go up against the British Army and hope to win. So General Washington needed those soldiers to be well-trained, well-disciplined, and to really know their job and to have the, the state-of-the-art weapons and equipment. Number two, he needed a Continental Army to survive. And as the war went on, and especially looking back at the course of the war now, we realize that part of Washington's genius as a military leader wasn't really how he fought the battles. On a tactical level, actually ordering his forces on an actual battlefield, he was okay. He, he could get by. But his real genius was in realizing that he didn't necessarily have to fight to win. He simply had to not lose. Now think about that for a second. The British Army is trying to put down a rebellion in 13 of its colonies. That means the British have to go from colony to colony and force them back under the control of the British Crown. That means they have to win. The Americans simply have to not lose and wait for the British to basically get tired, run out of money, run out of steam, and then American independence would be secured. In effect, that's what happened. So keeping the army intact and keeping the army well-trained and well-disciplined was the most important thing. But you can't have a good discipline unless you have soldiers who know their job, who are well-equipped. Continental soldiers didn't necessarily get paid much. We'll get into that in a second. But on to the life of a soldier. As I said, they're going to be doing a lot of marching. They're going to be doing a lot of drilling and training, learning how to use our weapons, learning how to build encampments quickly. And as they would march along, it was actually not very common during the campaign season in the summer for them to even have tents. You see behind me, this is the kind of place a part of the army might stop for a night. There's a home up, up top of the hill where the officers could stay. There's probably, a, it also means there's a fresh water source nearby, a stream, maybe a well where the soldiers could, could get water from. And the soldiers are not going to go hunt for food. They're going to be issued food from the army if the army has any food to issue. And we'll get into that in a second too. But all this marching, Day after day, week after week, month after, after month, means a soldier has to carry on his person everything he's going to need, not only to fight, but to live. So he's a fighter. We're going to come back to this in a second, his musket, but I want to put this down so I can go through with you what the soldier's stuff on his body is going to be. And... And by the way, let me make sure you know, since this is live, since this is an educational program, if any of you are watching who have questions, there will be time at the end to answer any and all of your questions about Continental Soldiers or the American uh, experience in the war. What is this thing? Why am I lugging this thing around along with a musket and all this other weight? This is a tin kettle. Now, not every soldier is going to carry this. But this is something that's going to be split up into a group of men called a mess. And a mess is not a formal military st structure or unit. It's anywhere from five to eight to ten men who sort of band together as friends. Perhaps they knew each other at home. They're the social unit of the army. They're going to march together. They're going to cook together. And so each member of a mess is going to carry a little bit of equipment for the group whether it's an axe for building defenses, whether it's an extra portion of food, or whether it's the kettle. Now, there's, there's nothing in this, although they, this is a multi-purpose thing, right? They can use this thing to carry water from a stream, but they're also going to do a lot of cooking with it. And it's big because, as I said, it's five to ten men who are going to be preparing their meal. So this is the division of labor, right? When they get to where they're finally going to camp, a couple of guys might go off and get water. A couple of guys might get the rations ready. A couple of guys might go gather hay or pine straw to lay on at night. And then they're all going to come back together. Someone's going to cook the food in this kettle. So this kettle is a very important part of the equipment of each mess. Now, the men marching are going to have to carry, as I said, everything on them. And I want you to think about your day. Right? When you wake up in the morning, you get out of bed in your bedroom, um, you probably go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you wash your face, and then you go to the kitchen and you're going to you know, prepare a meal and eat a meal and things like that. You're living in a house. 
And each room of your house generally has uh, one or two different purposes. Soldiers don't get to stay in houses all the time, very f seldom as a matter of fact. So they have to carry their rooms with them and that's what I'm going to go through with you now. So I'm going to start off with more or less a good part of the soldier's house. Now this is a backpack in period it would have been called a knapsack, right? And you notice it's very small, it doesn't have a lot of support. And one thing to point out too is all the straps for all this equipment is right here on my chest and even period accounts let soldiers say that sometimes it could be hard to breathe. It sort of constricted the chest, constricted breathing, and it wasn't for goodness about another 60 years that the United States Army decided, why don't we put some stuff on a belt and not put everything on straps across the chest? But that's neither here nor there. So what am I going to have in my knapsack? Let me open it up here. The uh, first thing I'm going to have in here, the biggest thing in my knapsack, uh, if I can get it out, is this. Goodness gracious me, it's an exciting blanket, right? Just a folded up wool blanket, maybe thin, maybe thick. This is my bedroom, right? This is where I'm going to sleep. This is what I'm going to cover up with if I'm cold. That's it. No pillow, no bed, no nice rug to sit my bare feet on when I get up. Just this blanket. That's the bedroom, okay? What else do I have in here? I have, oh, this could be very important. Maybe this is part of my bedroom. It could be, because I'm not going to sleep in this goofy hat. I'm going to sleep in this if it's cold, which is just a, a watch cap, piece of knitted wool that can go over my head, or I can even wear this in cold weather underneath my hat. Ah, here in my knapsack, and just for the record, that's it. That's all there is in my knapsack. It may not look like much, but there's my bathroom. And by bathroom, I literally mean a bathroom. I have um, a comb to keep my hair in order. Hygiene was actually considered very important in camp. I have here a mirror so that I can see my beautiful self as I comb my hair. And, you know, again, cleanliness and hygiene were important in camp. They were considered something important and essential to keep a soldier healthy and in fighting trim. So a razor, I also have a razor here. This razor may be shared by between several men of the mess. And so, you know, they, would, they could shave themselves. So there's, there's me getting ready. And something else in here, oh heavens, heavens, something incredibly valuable that I'm almost loath to show you it's so valuable, you might want to steal it. Do you know what that could be? That is a piece of soap, right? A piece of soap, so simple to us. We can, we can have any pieces of soap we want, but for, for a Continental soldier, a piece of soap was a rare treat, and it's the same soap they're going to use to wash their face, to shave with, to wash their hair, to wash their body, to wash their clothes if there are no washerwomen present. So that piece of soap could be a very, very valuable piece of equipment and maybe even something to barter with. So there's my bedroom, there's my bathroom, all carried in my knapsack. Well, what about my kitchen? Well... Let me show you these two pieces of equipment. Um, this one's pretty self-explanatory, of course. This is a canteen. And this is what a soldier's going to carry his water in when he's on the march, right? He's not necessarily going to drink in this, uh, drink from this in camp or anything like that. This is so that he'll have something to drink from on the march. Now, you can see it's just got a little spout in top. It just has a wooden plug and a linen strap so that I can carry it over my body. This canteen, empty, weighs a couple of pounds because it's made of oak. When you put water in it, it does become quite heavy. Now, this little piece, it looks a lot like my knapsack, uh, but it's not. It has just a single strap, sort of, that goes over your shoulder. It is called a haversack, and you'll notice it's very rattly and makes a lot of noise. Well, this, this is the kitchen, all right? This is where, if I'm issued any rations like uh, flour or pork, uh, salt pork or something like that. All my food is going to go in this bag. And in this bag, as I said, are going to be the kitchen. Oh, look, I have a tin cup, right? Got a drink out of something. 
I have a tin bowl, which is going to be my bowl, my plate, what I dip from the tin kettle in. And in here I also have, where did it go? A spoon. Again, it seems very simple, but this could be a very important part of a soldier's equipment. He doesn't have a spoon. He doesn't eat. So every soldier is going to have a spoon, whether he brings it from home, whether he steals it from a farmhouse on the side of the road, what have you. Now, they could, the, the food they're going to issue to soldiers, the main concern is that not so much that there will be a lot of it, but that it is preserved. There's not going to be a lot of fresh meat. There's not going to be a lot of fresh bread because those things you have to cook in place and, and carry it, and they'll go bad relatively quickly. So that's why they're going to have salt beef, salt pork. It's a good way of preserving the meat. They would put so much salt on this stuff that sometimes they would have to soak the meat for hours just to get some of the salt out of it. And of course, bread can go moldy and bad after just a few days, so they're going to need some kind of bread product they can give the soldiers. So they go with this. And this is really just a, a thick piece of, it's called ship's biscuit because it was often used on ship's voyages. By the time of the Civil War, they've got a new name for it, hardtack. But they didn't call it that in the American Revolution. Notice it's a round shape, and it really is just flour and water that they bake and then bake again. So it's basically twice bake, baked to get as much moisture out of it as possible. And that's it. That's, that's not a lot of stuff, is it? It can't be because, remember, the soldiers haven't carry everything that they're going to use and need. So they're going to be very, very selective with what they carry on their person, what they carry in their body. There's only a couple of other things that a soldier might carry. They're going to use their pockets. So here we have just a, right, just a basic pocket knife, an incredibly useful tool that can be used for a lot of different things. Almost every soldier is going to have a pocket knife in his pockets. And then here we have uh, a small wallet, an attache, whatever you want to call it, that a soldier may carry. This is not an issued piece, but they're going to need some place to put their papers, to put their money, and and so they might carry something in that. They have some, uh, if they're if they're lucky, they might have a little small lead pencil with some papers that they can write some notes with. But here we we come to an important issue. We come to to, to money, right? And and a continental soldier is going to be paid, in theory, $8 a month. Sure doesn't seem like a lot now, but back then, it still wasn't a whole lot, but, but it was a decent amount. But these dollars were, the, were basically Spanish coins, and I actually have, a, have an example I can show you, right? So it's going to be a Spanish silver coin. Eight of these per month, would be considered a small fortune in the American Revolution because they were very rare, very hard to get. Hard money, as they called it, uh, was hoarded, was spent up, and so to make things work, they would they would issue paper money, right? Today, our paper money is fairly stable, fairly common, but back then, it literally was worth the paper it was printed on. Usually it was the promise to pay silver coins sometime later on after the war was won. And I've got three reproduction sample examples here to kind of show you how inflation affected the war. So here we have one in 1776, just as independence is declared. And these are all three, like I said, reproduction notes from Georgia. They're, they're all going to be individually signed. This, this one is for only one Spanish milled dollar because inflation hasn't set in yet. Uh, let's see, here we have one uh, from 1777, and just one year later, this one's gone up to $5 value. Well, with inflation, things become much, much more expensive. Uh, let's see, we have here one in 1778. So, only, you know, a couple of years after independence is declared, and people are going to need bigger denominations of paper money to buy the things they need, even though they're worthless. This one, this single bill, is $40, right? And remember, 
a Continental soldier is only going to be paid eight dollars a month. Now, uh, speaking of money, just wanted to oh, that's right. <laughs> give a few shout outs because we've had some uh, significant donations oh, wonderful. Uh, during the program. So um, a big shout out to the Norman family who donated one hundred and one dollars. Thank you, Norman. And the, Nor <laughs> the Norman family says my kids are excited about the Monday history broadcast and actually pay attention. <laughs> So talking about our homeschool connection uh, program, we are so happy to have your kids there. They are such a positive part of our week. Thank you to the Norman family and thank, thank you to Merlene Dubay uh, for your $50 donation over the phone. Thank you so much, Merlene. Wow. Thank you. So yeah, so um, thank you for those donations. They go a long way. I assure you they go much further than a continental dollar would. And thank, oh, and thank you for, uh, to Regina. Regina, thank you so much for your $10 donation. Regina says, supporting proudly this magnificent attraction. Thank you so much, Regina. Thank you, Regina. So we've got through what a soldier is going to carry, his bedroom, his kitchen, his bathroom, uh, we've gotten through the pay that is going to be practically meaningless. There's a great uh, account from an original, one of the few accounts we have of a regular old soldier in the Continental Army called jo by a fellow by the name of Joseph Plum Martin. And if you haven't had a chance to read this book, I strongly recommend it. I think copies can be had. Uh, he wrote it as a memoir in his old age in the very early 1800s, so you can find copies on Google Book, I think, at no cost. And he served almost the entire war with the Continental Army. There are amazing stories he has, things like not having enough food and having to boil shoe leather just to have something to eat and chew on for caloric intake. But he also says that they never got paid except for one time. And somehow, and he still can't explain it, one month they all lined up and they actually paid them each eight of the silver dollars that they were due that month. And apparently they were so dumbstruck that they didn't know what to do with them because they'd never seen this much money in years and years. So Joseph Plum Martin, take a good look at that. Now, how about the uniform that I have on, right? Getting a uniform was considered part of your pay in 18th century armies because, as Marie has just said previously, sewing and fabric and clothes were expensive items. They were. They, there was a lot of labor that went into it. There was a lot of materials that went into it. So a full suit of clothes was a significant investment by anyone who bought them. And if the, if the Continental Congress is buying thousands and tens of thousands of uniforms, you can bet they're going to consider that part of the pay for a soldier because they're, they're a soldier's clothing. So I have on, I'll go from, from top to bottom, I have on this incredibly jaunty hat, not a tricorn, that's a word we use now, but they would call it a cocked hat because the, the hat is just round but is cocked up in three places. This one has some danglies, really just to denote uh, a little bit of rank and to look good for a soldier because looking good was actually considered an important part of a uniform for an 18th century soldier, probably more so than being practical. The soldiers didn't have any say in it. Here's your uniform. You get what you get. I have on uh, a tail coat. Let me turn around. You can kind of see the coat. The, it has uh, fronts and backs that sort of pin together right here so those can be let down in colder weather if i need more more coverage it has red facings and by facings i mean the parts that go down through here in the front and the cuffs and the collar generally speaking this is what denoted a military uniform from a civilian uniform they would be faced in different colors so that it would have this martial look and it has as you can see a lot of buttons Believe it or not, buttons could be a, a good part of the expense of a coat. Now, most people, when they think of a Continental soldier, think of a blue uniform with red facings. This is the image we have of the classic Continental. And later on, that was true. That was the color that George Washington generally wanted his soldiers to have for a uniform, classic American look, as opposed to the red British uniforms. But early on in the war, the Continental Army was willing to take anything that it could get. And so its ally, even before it became a formal ally, they purchased a lot of uniforms in France that came in both brown and in blue. 
And when they all came over to the United States, basically Washington said, well, we need to divide these out by regiments so that the regiments, at least within the unit, have the same color. So I am wearing one of those brown coats that was very typical, my accent belies it, but for some of those Pennsylvania and Massachusetts soldiers that were going to get this, this brown uniform. You see a lot of this style of continental uniform, say during the, the crossing of the Delaware for the Battle of Trenton, the Battle of Princeton, and almost all the way up to Saratoga in 1777. But later on in the war, in the North, the uniform had basically become the classic blue coat with red facings that we think of today. I also have on what we're in period called small clothes, a waistcoat that goes over a white shirt, just, and this is, could be either linen or wool, and wool trousers, wool knee trousers that come up, that come just below the knee. And then I have on stockings, which if you think of your socks, imagine your socks, but they go on right over your knee and then the pants sort of go over them and that right around your knee, they, they come together. They actually do provide a lot of warmth. And I have on those classic buckle shoes from the 18th century. Now, this is not by any stretch of the imagination what every single soldier is going to have at every point in the war. Supply issues, wearing out on campaign, soldiers are going to look very different. And, and there are a lot of instances that we know of where soldiers have been issued a uniform and they have to wear that uniform for so long during the campaign that they are simply going to be in rags. They may not even have proper shoes to wear. There are, there are accounts of men's shoes wearing out and they simply take like cow or pieces of goat hide, fold them over their feet and tie them at the ankle so they'll have something to go over their feet. So it, it really varies based on supply, based on the local situation, both north and south. And what I have on now and the equipment I have on now is pretty much what a newly issued soldier is going to look like. All this stuff is in pretty good shape. Now, let me uh, come back to the musket, right? This musket is, again, from France. This is a French uh, Charleville musket. It is a flintlock. It uh, has, it's a muzzleloader. It fires about a, it's a 69 caliber, 0.69 inches is what the barrel inside is. It's a smooth bore, so it does not have rifling. And the idea with these muskets is that they would be issued to military forces and the men would join together in large units in line and fire these weapons all at once, all in the same direction. That's how the tactics of the 18th century worked. And it's important to remember, sometimes as Americans, we tend to think back to the American Revolution and say, oh, well, the British were stupid. They wore red. We hid behind trees and fired at them one at a time. That's not how... Th Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> the soldiers needed to all be in line. Again, a good soldier could fire one of these about three times in one minute in ideal circumstances. It used probably closer to two times a minute. And the officers had to direct that fire to go to one place at one time to be as effective as it could be. And so the men had to drill and train in line how to move, how to make directional changes, how to about face, and do all these things together as one unit. There's a lot of drilling and training that goes into this. This is called a flintlock. Let me come a little closer uh, because it uses a concept of flint and steel. So, and, and we've got a video we want to show you of one actually being fired, but you have here a pan and you have a hole going through the barrel from the pan into the main part of the barrel. And you load the charge into the barrel, the main gunpowder part, with the ball, and you put a little bit of powder here, and then you close the pan like this. And I'm gonna show you, let me pull this back. And when you uh, pull the trigger, hopefully you saw some of those sparks. Those sparks are going to fall into the pan and set the gun off. Now. We want to go to a quick video uh, to show you, and it, it, the video is outdoors because, you know, outdoors is the place you want to fire a black powder weapon. And it goes through the details of how to load and how to fire the musket that is typical to an 18th century soldier. So I want to talk to you about how the weapon was loaded and fired in the American Revolutionary War. 
Both sides are going to be doing this in very, very similar ways. Only a few details would change. Now, you notice I also have the bayonet mounted. I'm going to take the bayonet off for this demonstration, but I did want to show you that it has an angle to it so that we could access the muzzle if we needed to with the bayonet attached. But as I said, we're going to take that off today to make it a little bit cleaner. Now I want to walk you through the process and then we'll actually load and fire the musket. So this is a muzzle loading weapon. It uses flint and steel to create a spark. So when a soldier does this, he's going to open the pan. The pan is here. There's a small hole drilled through the barrel to the pan so that the priming powder, when it ignites, can ignite the charge in the main barrel. So we're going to take a cartridge from our cartridge box. It'll be wrapped in paper. Inside the paper are some gunpowder and some uh, and a lead ball. They'll take that cartridge, rip it with their teeth, put a little bit of powder here in the pan to prime, not the entire charge, and shut it. Then they're going to cast about. They will pour the powder first and then the ball down the barrel. They'll draw the ramrod like this. Make sure that it is all the way down to the bottom. That's a very important part of the process. Replace the ramrod because that's important. Then they will go to shoulder arms. This is an important step because the officers need to know when everyone is loaded and ready to fire. So all soldiers, when they are loaded and ready to fire, will take the musket, put it at their shoulder, and when everyone is there, the officer will give the command, make ready, take aim, fire. And then they will pull the trigger, and that will ignite the priming charge, which ignites the main charge, which sends the ball down range. That's the process of how it's loaded. That's the, really the mechanics of it. So I'm going to do this in time with a charge to show you how it actually looks. I'm going to do it from the side so you can see it. So the soldier will be at shoulder arms and he will be given the order to load and fire. Then come back to this position and listen for another order to load and fire if they're doing it by volley. If they're uh, loading and firing, they will simply go back to loading at this moment. So that's the process. You see, it can be rapid. All those motions have to take place in a short amount of space because, of course, they have a lot of friends on either side of them. That's the loading and firing of the Revolutionary War musket. All right, so you saw there the glory of firing a flintlock musket. And a lot of those movements and motions that I was going through, they seem sort of stiff and, and, and rigid, but they're supposed to be because you have to remember that you're in a line, you're in linear formation uh, with your company. A company is going to have anywhere from, from dependent upon, again, when the war, how big the unit is, from 30 to 50 men, and a regiment's going to have anywhere from 300 to 500 men in it, and they're all going to be standing shoulder to shoulder, and they're going to have to be moving their musket around, they're going to have to be marching um, in, in line, and so these movements have to be very practiced and very rigid. And when I say training and drilling, that's really what I mean, is that first of all, when a soldier comes to the Continental Army, they're going to learn to do those things, as you saw me just doing, one at a time. The, the corporals are going to take these new men to the side, they're going to work through the motions with them, help them understand the basics. Then they're going to be put into a larger unit, uh, just a group perhaps of 10 or 20 men so they can figure things out. And then the company is going to drill and practice so that the officers and the men can learn how the company is supposed to operate in battle. And then they're going to have larger and larger up to the regimental and perhaps the brigade level. Now, when I'm saying company and division and things like that, what, what does that really mean? So for the American Army, as I said, a company on paper was supposed to be about 50 men. With attrition, with losses in battle, with desertion, sometimes that figure could get as low as 20 to 25. But a regiment is supposed to have about 10 companies in it. So you just multiply that number by 10, and that's where you get the number for a regiment, anywhere from, from four to 500 men. 
This is the confusing part. When you start reading about the American Revolutionary War and the battles and the units, sometimes they'll call something a regiment, sometimes they'll call something a battalion. This is very confusing. And I'm going to be honest, for years, I couldn't grasp the concept because they just used them interchangeably and never described the difference. Well, I'm about to let you in on the military historian secrets. They're the same thing. A regiment and a battalion, for all intents and purposes, is the same thing. It's weird. Basically, when it's marching, when it's doing paperwork, when it's getting supplies, it's a regiment. When it's on the battlefield and actually participating in a battle, according to the drill manuals, it's a battalion. I know it seems silly, but that's the way it works. So don't worry too much about those terms. And, and generally speaking, in the American Army, uh, a captain is going to be in charge of a company, and a colonel is going to be in charge of a battalion or a regiment, and a major is going to be there to sort of be his second in command. And to when they would combine several different regiments together, three to five, that would be placed under a brigade. And a brigade, you would have a colonel or a brigadier general. And a brigade, uh, two or, or more brigades, would be formed into a division. And then a uh, division would go all the way up to an army. So again, depending upon a, what part of the war you're in, how big the armies are, you're going to have these different groupings of men. And that helps the officers be able to give, as we would say today, command and control. You want to be able to organize things, give your orders to only four or five men, and then those men could, uh, your division commanders would tell their brigade commanders, the brigade commanders will tell the regimental commanders, the regimental commanders will tell the company commanders. And so it goes. Now, that can still be very confusing on the battlefield. You probably noticed when I fired the musket, just one time, a lot of smoke came out of that. So imagine 50 men in each company firing all at once. When they do, your target is going to be obscured for the next at least few seconds. And the people shooting at you are going to do the same thing. It's a very, very confusing thing. Sometimes they would try to use drums on the battlefield to give commands, but as you can imagine, a drum may sound a lot like an artillery boom or a musket boom, so that can also be very confusing. Battles are very confusing. They're very, very frightening, right? People are trying to kill you. You're trying to kill other people. And so the experience of battle in this time period was something that was different for each person, but everyone was probably afraid, and, and that's the thing you have to remember. When I say a good soldier can fire three times a minute, well, you know, just standing there practicing with no one trying to kill me, I can, I can load and fire this thing three times a minute. If there's someone 50 yards away from me trying to do the same thing, I'm probably going to start shaking and, and, and slow down a good bit, right? So a Continental soldier, why were they fighting for American independence? As I said, the ones who had done it for adventure or to get a, a quick amount of money, they, they've disappeared by the middle of the war. And, and it's Washington's men, and, and in the South, the ones he sent South under Nathaniel Green, they're the ones who hang on, keep the Continental Army alive and a, and a center of resistance. You have to remember, the British won most of the battles of the American Revolution. George Washington lost most of the battles he was a general at, but he kept the army alive. And the British, they took city after city. They took Savannah. They took Charleston, they took Philadelphia, they took Boston, they took New York. They took all the cities where uh, re resistance to the crown was centralized. But it didn't matter because that Continental Army that embodied the spirit and reality of resistance remained intact. And it's those officers and men, more than anything else, on the American side of the Atlantic that really made a difference in us achieving victory. Now, there's lots of other things that go into the American Revolution. The help of the French and the Spanish is incredibly important and central uh, because when they joined the war, not only did they give us aid, but it forced Britain to fight the war not just in the 13 colonies, but across the entire Atlantic Ocean, in the Caribbean, in, in uh, the Mediterranean, in India. So their forces become spread very, very thin we're getting more and more help, so we have a great victory in the Americas eventually, but not all at once. So now, 
if, uh, if anyone has any questions about the things I've talked about today, about some of the equipment, how the men fought, how the men lived, or just a general question about the American Revolution, please put that in the chat and we will answer it as, as best we can. Yeah, so while, while everybody's thinking of those questions, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Ed and Diane Mann for their $50 donation. Yay, thank you. Th thank you so much, uh, Ed and Diane. And they say, we have been enjoying the broadcast from Northeast Georgia History Center since our grandson Joshua started going to your summer camps. He has loved all of them and the other classes he has taken and often reminds me of interesting upcoming ones. Hope your <laughs> fundraiser is a success. Well, y'all are certainly helping us uh, make it a success and Josh is an awesome student we have Josh in uh, in homeschool connection and yep. he's often in the in the streams as well so <laughs> thank you so much now uh, let's see if anyone has questions but in the meantime Glenn could you speak to uh, the roles of women during this time yeah absolutely and it would be a mistake to think that women did not play a role in the movement for American independence uh, both ideologically and, and physically. So women are 50% of the population now, just as they were then, and, and they had voices. Now, society and culture is different. It, it did tend to place women in a more secondary and subservient role to their male counterparts, especially once they were married. We have great letters back and forth between John and Abigail Adams, which is probably the closest example that we have to an equal partnership in the 18th century and those letters are fantastic and you can tell there was a real tenderness and affection that they had for one another and we always look to that and we should but I don't want you to think that that was a, a typical relationship either many uh, marriages were made for convenience many marriages were made for economic necessity but they did play a role there there were women at the in the crowd at the Boston Massacre, right? There were women who participated in the war effort. As a matter of fact, women were part of the army, an official part of the army, and and not for what some of you may be thinking. Uh, the soldiers, as I said, had a lot of duties to do. They had to, to dig entrenchments. They had to march. They are not always going to have time to keep their uniforms clean, to keep uh, to to cook their food. So uh, the Continental Army per regiment had a set number of women that were allowed to come along with the regiment to serve as cooks and washerwomen. And they would not necessarily get paid by the Continental Army, but they would be allowed to draw rations. They would be allowed to eat from the army supplies and the men were expected to pay them for the washing that they did. It was not required that the men have their washing done by the women, but it sure was convenient and the women could make money this way and accompany the army. And if they had had children, they could bring the children as well. Now, like I said, it was generally not allowed for every soldier's uh, wife or, or sister or, or mother or girlfriend to come along with the army. It was a very formal role. And so not everyone had their wives there, but some men could. And these women became an everyday part of the army, became an everyday part of camp life, not only doing cooking and cleaning, but sometimes they may, may be able to uh, get some vegetables with some trade locally and be able to sell those vegetables to the men. Uh, they may have other wares that they could sell. They may be able to make shirts. Uh, and that's what you have to remember. These uniforms, uh, the men only get one coat, um, one you know pair of breeches, really the shirt is the, I don't want to say disposable because they're still not disposable, but that's the piece that's closest to your skin, right? That's what the men are going to get dirty. They're going to sweat on it. That's what has to be washed on a regular basis to maintain health. So if they're lucky, they might have two shirts, but more frequently, they're only going to have one and that shirt's going to have to, have to be washed to stay healthy on a regular basis. So the women are going to have a lot of work. They may be able to make shirts. So Women play an important role in army life. Women play an, uh, an important role in just keeping the spirit of the people moving because you have to remember that wars are won on the battlefield, but they're also won in the spirits of the people, of the nation on behalf of which the war is being fought. And that, that home front belief 
And the cause is going to be an incredibly important factor in keeping the cause going. And the cause of independence had support from both men and women. However, incredibly complicated sidebar, there were also a lot of men and women who believed that the rebels were bad, who believed that the crown should be superior, and they stayed loyal to the British. These folks were called Tories, and that is an incredibly complicated story. Libba, can I have six more hours to talk about that? Uh, maybe next time. Okay, maybe next time. <laughs> maybe in our second annual telethon. Yes, absolutely. So, um, Nick in the chat says, Glenn, so, uh, what role did aliens play in the American Revolution? Just kidding. Great idea and great job. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. But it does bring to mind aliens of a different sort. So, uh, when it comes to people who are not citizens or not, uh, settlers or, or colonists, uh, you, you, you mentioned Spain's role. I mean, outside right. of those who were formerly under the, the British crown, uh, talk about the, those, um, those connections uh, outside of Britain or outside of the Americas that helped in the war effort. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways we can look at this. We can look at the big picture. And from the big picture, backing up a couple of decades, the British had won the French and Indian War, which had kicked France out of, uh, totally kicked France out of North America and had kicked a fair bit of Spain out of North America, right? This was a huge war for empire. In Europe, they called it the Seven Years' War. Britain had come out on top, big time, in the great game of empire between nation states. Those nation states wanted to get back at Great Britain in any way that they could, and maybe maybe get some, some territory back, but they just really wanted to humble Great Britain and bring it down a peg or three internationally and economically. So when the American Rebellion began to take place, Spain and France were like, hmm, interesting. Let's, let's watch this for a little bit. Let's, you know what? They haven't immediately been crushed. Let's, let's send them some weapons. Let's send them some money. Let's, let's get a ship in there that maybe they can use on, on, the, on the seas. This began very informally at first. Uh, Spain set up what today we would call a shell company, right, to, to, to funnel weapons and money through the south, through the, through the Gulf of Mexico, what's now the Gulf of Mexico, up to the rebels and made its way all the way up into the Carolinas and even to Virginia. Once uh, Spain and France initially became involved formally in the war, by which I mean that, that Spain and France declare war against Great Britain in support of the American cause for independence. It is a total shift in the war, and I alluded to this briefly earlier. But when France and Spain come in, it turns from a fairly localized rebellion against British power to a world war, at least on a small scale, that the British are now having to fight not just in North America. They have to fight the Spanish in the Caribbean and the French in the Caribbean. They have to fight the uh, Spanish in the Mediterranean. They have to fight the French in India. Britain has a finite amount of resources. And so they have to start pulling ships and men from North America and sending them to the Caribbean and to the Mediterranean and to India. And so when France is able to, and to, sp to send some soldiers to North America, when Spain is able to send its navy to the, to the southern part of the, uh, or I guess technically the middle Atlantic where the Caribbean is, they start to overwhelm the English powers. And, and most of us know about the French helping us out, right? They were at Yorktown and, and things like that. But the Spanish role has tended to be understated, unfortunately. And, but when you start looking at it, I've been reading some, some great books on this the last, the last year or so. Spain played an incredibly vital role in, uh, in securing American independence. I just mentioned the Battle of Yorktown, right? The American army was there. The French army was there. The Spanish people weren't there. But do you know where the money came from to pay for the French fleet and the American soldiers and the French soldiers? All the money for the Yorktown campaign came as a loan from the Spanish that went on the, the, uh, the, the French ships that went on up to the Yorktown Peninsula. The Spanish allowed, or didn't allow it, but, but helped that to happen. Huge role. That's the, that's the grand overarching different uh, nationalities coming in. Now in a smaller role, um, you know, there were some Spanish soldiers along the Gulf. The, the Battle of, of Galveston, um, I'm sorry, the, the Battle of Pensacola, 
led by a, a Spanish general named Galvez, for whom Galveston is named, uh, was, was a French victory and a, excuse me, a Spanish victory and a victory for the American cause. The Hessians that were brought over by the British to serve as mercenaries for the cause of the British crown and putting down the rebellion, a lot of those Hessians got here, got captured, and realize that, you know what, this is, a, this is a pretty good place to live. This is a very rich land. There's lots of opportunity. I'm either not going back to the army. I'm going to desert. And to get land, because land was given often as a reward for military service in the American army, they joined the American army to fight for the Americans. And then they were going to get land afterwards. Same thing happened with a lot of Irish. Same thing happened with a lot of the British soldiers, actually. So you get a lot of this amalgamation in the Continental Army that simply isn't really present in the formal armies of Britain or of Spain or of France. The, the Continental Army, as I said, becomes a, a polyglot of, of different uh, nationalities and different backgrounds. African Americans, uh, free and enslaved, uh, Germans, British, some French, um, it's, it's a remarkable thing, and it becomes a very diverse force by the end of the war in 1783. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, of, of cross-nationality influences on the American Revolution. It's not, it's not just Americans hiding behind trees and shooting the rifles at people in red coats. <laughs> So it uh, looks like we, we don't have any questions in the chat, uh, but we are uh, at the end of our hour. And I also want to thank Nick for his $15 donation. Thank you so much, Thanks, Nick. Nick. You must have liked your, your answer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, everyone, I also just put in the chat on uh, Facebook and YouTube our program, which has all of our donation tiers. So we have lots of awesome thank yous. Um, in, in our donation tiers. So take a look at those, make your donation. And uh, coming up next, we are going to have a, a open fire cooking demonstration with Marie. Um, but before we head out, uh, <laughs> Glenn, is there anything that you feel like uh, as a historian that people ought to know or, or that people often misunderstand about the American Revolution that you want to leave us with today? Yeah. Uh, the one thing I'll tell you is that, and, and this can be applied to a lot of history, but perhaps especially to the American Revolution. Today, we have what could be interpreted as a foregone conclusion, a, a, a specific inevitable sense of destiny that the American nation was going to not only be born, but, but survive and thrive. And when you look at the time, that simply wasn't the case. The founding fathers, and just using that term, comes with a lot of baggage too, but some of them admit, like John Adams, they didn't know what they were doing because they had, there had never been a revolution like this before. There had never been a war like this before. And so they're kind of just finding their way, doing what's best, always on the verge of what seemed like disaster. As I said, George Washington lost battle after battle, right? This was not an inevitable event by any stretch of the imagination. And even the Battle of Yorktown, which we think of as the last battle of the American Revolution, does anyone out there know when it took place? It was October of 17, uh, 1781. When was the peace treaty signed? 1783. So there's at least a good year and a half of time when the Americans don't know it's over. Right? There's been a huge victory at Yorktown, but that doesn't put the official seal of the end on the, on the war for independence. There's a lot that still has to be done. So, so don't think of the American Revolution or anything in history. Don't take its outcome for granted just because we can look back and see what the outcome was. Put yourself in their place. Understand their struggles. Understand their uncertainty. And understand that they're doing the best that they can in a situation that they don't know how it's going to end. All right, we'll pick up where we left off. We were talking about Abigail Adams, wife of John Adams, who was very much in charge of their estate while her husband was away doing things with the Continental Congress um, and overseeing 
the American Revolution. So she was very much in charge with, of the children, she was in charge of their estate and everything that that entailed. Women at this time were not allowed to own property themselves. Um, it would become, if they had property, it would become property of their husbands when they married. But she, at this time, was really referring to their property as hers. She kind of reclaimed it, not necessarily in a legal sense, uh, that was not possible, but very much in the I ideological sense, she very much thought of herself as in charge of that realm. There are many letters between Abigail and John where they are talking about things that are going on at the house, what they're doing. One of the big things that they kind of had this debate about going back and forth was whether to inoculate their children, which is kind of like the early idea of vaccine against smallpox during the American Revolution. This was a disease that wiped out a large population. It was very much um, when it happened or struck a community, it was very devastating. But then they came up with this idea of inoculation, which would be when you run a thread through the, you know, the pox of someone who was infected, and then they would run the needle and thread through the skin of a healthy person. That gives them a slight, uh, the disease in a smaller amount, very much like what you do with today's vaccines, and therefore you might get a little sick, but you're not going to die from it. Um, so that's an example of what Abigail Adams was doing, doing during the American Revolution. And then we are going to go to Eliza Schuyler, or as she is later known, Eliza Hamilton, because she became the wife of Alexander Hamilton, the Revolutionary War hero. And she was doing things such as gathering, um, gathering clothing, gathering food, and either giving it to people who were in need because their supporter, their um, husband or brothers, uh, and someone who was to provide for them was either away fighting the American Revolution or she was giving these things to sh soldiers themselves because the supply train uh, was not always able to keep up with the American uh, army themselves. We also have a woman right here from Georgia, Nancy Hart, and she is almost larger than life, more myth and legend than historical fact, but we have some things that have happened later that I'm going to get into in just a second that do corroborate her story. So Nancy Hart, we have several towns and a whole county named for her here in Georgia, was actually named Ann Hart, but Nancy was a nickname for Ann at the time. So Nancy Hart was living out in a cabin up in northeastern Georgia, and that's also an area where some British soldiers were hanging out as well as um, continental soldiers. And there are lots of stories of incidences of uh, British soldiers coming to spy on Nancy Hart and see what she was up to, and she would fend them off and shoo them away. Uh, but the, the biggest story of hers is when there were, I believe it was six uh, redcoats came into her house and they killed her last chicken and they demanded that she cook it for them. And she was not about to have that, but she was a smart woman. So she had them come into her house, she got them drunk on her corn liquor, and then while they were uh, not exactly the most focused of people. She snuck out their guns through the side of her log cabin. So we know it was a very rustic log cabin, which means there were gaps between the, the logs, and that's how she passed them out of her house to one of her many children. And then she kept one and held them at gunpoint, uh, waiting for either her children to go signal someone or uh, just until continental troops came by to then capture them. During the time when she was holding him gunpoint, one soldier actually rushed her and she shot him dead. And then the rest of them decided that they were not going to try that. Eventually her husband and some other continental soldiers came by. They held trial because they held trial because they had killed her chicken and then they hung them the next day. And that is the tale of Nancy Hart. It's hard to say whether for sure that happened or not, but it is uh, some archaeological evidence happened where they went to whether they believed the Hart cabin was and they did find the body of six men. So it's very, the story is plausible, but we aren't exactly for sure. 
but that, that is Nancy Hart. She was said to be a six foot red headed burly woman, which I think that's just a larger than life character. She was also illiterate, so it's not like she could necessarily write or recount the story in some type of writing that would become a historical document. Uh, this is a challenge for historians as if you have a large portion of the population that is illiterate, it is hard for them to then create documents that survive them. So you go on oral history. And that brings me to my next woman, Betsy Ross. So you might know Betsy Ross as a woman who sewed the first American flag. And while we believe that story to be true, it is hard to say with 100% certainty that that is the case because there are no surviving documents from her time period that said she did. But we have the sworn affidavits of her children and grandchildren in the 1870s, almost 100 years after the first American flag was to have been created. So to show you, you can see there is the flag behind me, but then I also have the fabric flag here that I will show you. So Betsy Ross's there we go. So Betsy Ross's children and grandchildren swore that she had created the first American flag. And they recount the story that George Washington, Robert Morris, and George Ross came to her house with this design because they were on the flag committee and asked her if she could make it. Now, things we do know about Betsy Ross. One is that, well, her last name was Ross. She was married to a man named Ross, and George Ross, who was on the flag committee, was her husband's uncle. At the time, it was her late husband, because he had died during the American Revolution, during the early part of the American Revolution. So that, that's one thing that makes it seem very plausible. Uh, she had a connection to someone on the flag committee. She, we also know for certain that she had done uh, some uh, sewing for General Washington. She had made his bag, uh, bed hangings, um, that go on his bed and also that she had sewn some buttons on for him. She also went to the same church as him and we know her pew was right next to his. So all things seem plausible that Betsy Ross did sew the first American flag up to this point. It was said that she was the one who suggested that the flag uh, that these stars be sewn into a circle and that they be five point instead of six point because it was easier to create and to sew. It would later become said that the flags, the stars uh, on the flag were put in a circle to represent that each colony, which they represent, was equal and that none was above the other. We aren't exactly sure there because there are very not that many documents survive from the flag committee uh, to say why they chose red, white, and blue, but we do have the documents from the seal when they created the great seal of America that say they chose the red for courage, the white for innocence, and then the blue for vigilance. Or as some people attribute George Washington to saying, we stole the stars from the sky, we stole the red from the British, and we have the white because that represented them seceding from the mother country. So a lot of the American Revolution uh, ideas and sayings and things like George Washington chopping down the cher cherry tree are a little bit more, well, legendary than historical fact. Uh, so we have kind of the American myth of these things. But there are, again, not necessarily for George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, that's just completely a legend. But for Betsy Ross, there is some, some uh, historical fact that back up her making the flag. We, the only, we know she made American flags. We aren't sure she made the first American flag. That's really hard to say, because there is payment for her making flags um, for the Continental Army, for the Navy, but we aren't just, it's really hard to say, and we can't say for certain if it was indeed the first. But it does seem plausible. Um, I would also, I'm just going to say, sometimes we get confused with the Betsy Ross flag and then the Star Spangled Banner. So to clear that up very quickly, this behind me is the Betsy Ross flag this that I have folded over my arm. That's the Betsy Ross flag, the continental uh, one that we have for the American Revolution. And then some people like to say that Mary's Pickard's Guild made this flag, and that is that is not 
she did not make, Mary Pickers Guild did not make this a flag that necessarily looked like this. She made the flag that is the Star Spangled Banner, which inspired the national anthem, but that was not until the War of 1812, and I believe she made it in 1813. So, just so that will set the record straight for that one. Mary's Pickers Guild and Betsy Ross were not in a battle over who made the first American flag um, because they are in different wars and different time periods. So that's the great thing about the American Revolution. There are so many great narratives. There are so many complexities about it. There's so many individual stories like Nathan Hale and, and Nancy Hart and Betsy Ross. We hope you go out and do a lot more research on this. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in today. I wish we had more time. Thanks, Marie, for joining us yes, again. Absolutely. Um, and we hope that you've enjoyed these. We hope you tell all your friends and all your family. <laughs> Please continue to watch. If you can give us any financial support during this time, we appreciate it. But if you can't, that's okay. We're just glad to have you. So until we see you next time, stay safe and take care.